begin with some words from the psalmist who says this, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Well, let's sing to this our God, hymn number 196 in our blue hymn books, 196. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation, 196.
Well, as you sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, when we ponder anew what you, the Almighty, can do, we are lost in wonder, love, and praise. You are the God who is high and above all things. You mightily reign in majesty and power. And yet you are also the God who has graciously condescended to us in the person of your Son. You are the God who's come to prosper us and befriend us, to defend us and keep us safe at your side, gently sustaining us. And so, gracious Father, we praise and adore you in our hearts, for you truly are our health and salvation. And we echo the words of the psalmist in our hearts this morning, that we rejoice in you because you have made known to us the path of life, the narrow gate, the narrow way that leads to life everlasting in your glorious presence. And how we so desperately need you to keep us on that path of life. So often, Father, we confess that our hearts are, are prone to wander, prone to leave you, the God we love. We just think back over the past week and of the times when we've fallen short of your glory. Perhaps we've professed to belong to you and to your Son, and yet perhaps only minutes later, we found ourselves behaving in ways that would suggest otherwise. And so, Father, we ask for your mercy in Christ. Please keep us trusting in your Son, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And we ask that you would draw near to us this morning as we gather around your holy written word. Please come and speak into our hearts. Break forth as light in us. And so scatter the terrors of night that so often grip us and haunt us. Work in us this day by your blessed spirit so that we will be a people who are always bowing down before you in our hearts in humble worship and obedient submission. Give us a hunger within us to seek your face, to go the narrow way and to persevere all the days of our lives. We pray and ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, amen. And uh, let me welcome you all once again to our service, those of you up here, upstairs, and those of you downstairs on the screens. I hope you can see me and hear me. And a special welcome to you all if you're here for a baptism this morning of little Jude Larman. And uh, I'll ask Matthew and Nicola and Jude to come up in a wee second. But before that, let me just explain what we're about to do in this baptism. Listen to the words of the institution of the sacrament of baptism, as was delivered by our Lord and Saviour, to his disciples after his resurrection, but before he ascended to the right hand of the Father in heaven. Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to be all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now Jesus was speaking there of the fulfillment of a day that the Old Testament prophets had long foretold many years before of a coming day when through the Messiah, God would do something new on the earth. No longer just chiefly among the Jewish people, but for people of all nations, every tribe, tongue, and, and nation. A people called out by God to be cleansed and to be renewed by his grace through the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So listen, for example, to the prophet Ezekiel, who said this, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, my commandments. And then there's the prophet Joel likewise said, in that day I will pour out my spirit upon you. And the sacrament of baptism thus instituted is a sign and a seal of God's ongoing covenant grace 
in this new age that we live in. And it speaks of the fulfillment and for all uh, of those Old Testament washings and sprinklings that we read about, all of them find their fulfillment in the Lord Jesus. That's what baptism is really showing us. And it also speaks of our engrafting into the Lord Jesus through the once for all forgiveness of sins brought by his sprinkled blood. It speaks of regeneration because it symbolizes the pouring out of a spirit from his ascended throne. And it also therefore preaches to us the joyful message of true adoption and of resurrection life that is promised for all who belong to the Lord Jesus. Now, of course, little children such as Jude don't understand these things yet, but God's promise is also to them. Children born to believing parents have by their birth an interest in the gospel covenant. They are heirs, if you like, of the covenant of grace. They've been set apart. That's what the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Corinthian church. And therefore, little ones are entitled to the seal of that covenant, which is baptism, which is what we're about to do today. In other words, our little ones belong to the church of Jesus Christ just as much as we do. Now, of course, there's nothing magic about the act that we're about to do, but rather it is, if you like, a visible word of God's grace to us. And in this sacrament, God is once again saying, as the Lord Jesus said long ago, let these little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And if Christian parents are hearing these words and if they bring their children forward for baptism, they're, they're really saying, yes, Lord, let it be so for my little one. And this covenant act of baptizing a helpless infant, it's also a standing witness to the priority of God's grace over our faith in the Christian life. In doing this, we declare to the whole world that what God does for us, he does without our merit and without even our knowledge. In baptism, perhaps more plainly than anywhere else, we see that God commends his love towards us, as the Apostle Paul says, and that while we were still without strength and enemies with him, Christ died for us. And so in the gospel, God's word of grace comes to us freely and actually without any response on our part. And yet remember, of course, at the same time, God's word of promise, it never comes to us without also calling for a response on our part. It calls us to the obedience of faith. In due time, of course, from little Jude himself, but already and now from his parents, Matthew and Nicola. And so this word that we proclaim today in baptism, it's not a word that can be treated lightly. This isn't a lightly thing. It's not a casual thing. It calls for real faith and trust. Yes, God has promised great things to Christian parents, but they must take him seriously. And by trusting in his word and bringing up their little one in faith and not fear. Indeed, God's word commands us as Christian parents that we must bring up our little ones in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. And that is why it is the duty of those who present their children for baptism to confess the faith into which the little one is being baptized. And so with all of that in mind, I'd like to invite Matthew and Nicola up to confess that faith before you all. Come up and join me. Now, Matthew and uh, Nicola, especially to you, Matthew, as uh, the husband, as the one who's been set apart by God to be the leader of the household, Jude depends chiefly on you both for help and encouragement that he needs. And so therefore, I ask you this. In presenting Jude for baptism, do you confess your trust in God as your heavenly Father and in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier? And do you promise, depending on divine grace, to teach him the truths and the duties of the Christian faith and by prayer, precept, and example, to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? All of us gathered here today, we, as the household of faith in this church, we have a big important part to play in this. For we too are called to play our part in the nurture of this little one and his nurture in the way of the Lord. 
and by your prayers and by your commitment to his parents, you too and me as well, we are all to encourage them in their steadfast love for him. And so to acknowledge our part in this, I would like to ask us as a congregation to please stand with Matthew and Nicola now. Well, Jude James Larman, I baptise you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon you and dwell in your heart forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so according to Christ's commandment, Jude is now received into the fold and family of this church, engaged to grow to confess his faith in Jesus Christ and to be his servant and soldier all the days of his life. Well, as we stand together, let's pray. O oh Lord, the God of the eternal covenant promises to us in Christ, please, we, we ask that you will grant all of us the faith to be true to what we have promised. May this precious family and this whole church family seize upon these wonderful tokens of your abundant grace that you have given us this day and so appropriate them with gladness and joy that what is done today in marking out this little one as yours may indeed stand for all eternity for the glory and the honor of your son our savior the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, as uh, we remain standing, please do grab your hymn books and turn to number 933. 933. Our children, Lord, in faith and prayer, we bring before your face. Let them your covenant mercy share and save them by your grace. Well, as you take your seats, let me say to you, you should have received one of these notice sheets as you came in this morning. These contain all that you need to know about the various goings on in the life of our church, our services that are happening today, this afternoon and this evening. And uh, also 
inside details of our children's work and creches, etc. Let me just highlight uh, one midweek notice. It's our congregational prayer meeting this Wednesday night. Do join us here at 7.30 as we pray for our world, our church, and our gospel partners. On the back there, you'll notice as well, there are plenty of other uh, extra notices to take notice of. The His Word in My Hands conference and Easter holiday clubs. I'll leave you to read these in your own time. Well, we come now to, uh, oh, sorry, one more last notice. Whoa, one very important notice, sorry. Uh, congratulations to Jane and Ali Taylor and uh, to the Taylor family as uh, they had a wee baby girl on Thursday. Uh, as yet unnamed, and so it's just a wee baby girl just now. <laughs> But it's a wee sister for Harry and, and Molly, so that's wonderful to the Taylor family. Well, we come now to our Bible reading, uh, so please do take up your Bibles, and you'll find that in the New Testament book of Matthew. That's on page 812 of our church Bibles. I'm delighted to say that Edward Lobb will be preaching to us from this passage later in the service. And uh, we're in Matthew chapter 7. And uh, Edward will be focusing on verse 13 and 14, but it uh, be good to get a bit of context. So let's start our reading at uh, Matthew 7, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. This is the words of the Lord Jesus speaking. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which... One of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Well, amen, and may God bless to us this, his word. Well, our offering for the Lord's work will now be collected. Perhaps you'd like to spend the time by looking over those verses that we've just read or pray for someone who is in need as our offering is now collected.
Let's pray together. Almighty God, loving Lord and Heavenly Father, all nations should bow down in adoration before you. All people who dwell on earth should extol and praise you. All of mankind should willingly live under your rule and reign, obeying your law of life with joy unspeakable in their hearts, reflecting your image and your beauty throughout all the earth, loving one another. Universal worship such as this from humanity is what you rightfully deserve to receive. But Lord, as we look at the peoples, look at the nations, indeed, as we look into our own hearts, we see that this is not so. We've all fallen and short of the purpose for which you've made us. The world is full of rebels, people exactly like us. And so the world groans and is full of pain and suffering because our hearts isn't, aren't what they should be. Now, Father, we cry out to you for your mercy. We pray especially this morning for the people of Christchurch in New Zealand. Father, we think of the shocking and atrocious attacks that have happened there just in the past week where some 50 people were killed, 50 people who were made to bear your image, destroyed by a monster. And yet that man was not a monster. He was a man, a human being just like us. Oh, Father, what a sobering reminder that is of the evil that we're all capable of. A stark reminder of what we could all be if it weren't for your gracious hand restraining us. We thank you, Father, that there are so many of your people, your church, our brothers and sisters in Christ, living in that city. And we ask that you would, by your spirit, embolden and activate them to be reaching out with great love and care to all the society around about them, but especially to those who've been deeply affected. May the families and loved ones of the victim come into contact with your people so that your people will show them compassion and help and care. And most importantly, may your people share the momentous news of the Lord Jesus Christ with them, that he is the true and living God, the only one who can cleanse and renew and heal us and reconcile us to you. We pray that the gospel of Christ and his kingdom would be made known all over Christ's church. And we dare to ask that as a result of this evil that was committed, many would turn and go the narrow way, turn in repentance and faith to trust your son. And so, Father, now as we come to your word in just a few moments, we ask that you will speak to us and change us Please open our hearts and our ears so that we will listen with faith and so that we will have greater assurance of your majestic power and that power will keep us on the narrow way. Please subdue every part of us through the preaching of your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, before we come to God's word, we're going to sing, uh, and uh, it's hymn number 548, How Sure the Scriptures Are, 548.
Well, good morning, friends. <clears throat> Can we turn together to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, which you'll find on page 812 in our Bibles. It's always a help to have the actual words in front of us, and then uh, you can see them for yourself. <clears throat> but I'll read them out clearly as well. Matthew chapter 7, and I'll be reading in a moment verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> now, my title for this morning is The Way to Life. The Way to Life. And I want to speak on this very short section of the teaching of Jesus. In these words, the Lord Jesus is addressing the world. In other words, he's speaking to every one of us. He says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And do you see there that Jesus is saying to us, make sure that you find the way to life, to eternal life, because many people don't. Many people take the easy way, which leads to destruction. But he says, fewer are the ones who find the way to life. I don't know whether you've read The Pilgrim's Progress, written by John Bunyan in the 17th century. For a long time, it was the most popular book in the English language after the Bible itself. And in the opening scene, the author has a dream. The whole book is really cast in the form of a dream. But in his dream, at the very beginning, he sees a poor, ragged man. And this ragged man is in great distress. The man is reading a Bible. And as he reads it, he cries out, what shall I do? But immediately afterwards, he meets another man. And this other man is called Evangelist. And Evangelist points with his finger and he says to the ragged man, do you see a wicket gate over there? The man says, no. So evangelist then says to him, well, do you see a shining light? The ragged man says, I think I do. So evangelist says to him, follow that light and you will then see the gate. Knock there and you'll be told what to do. And at that moment, the ragged man broke into a run. And as he runs on, he cries out, life, life, eternal life. And he keeps on running, and he never stops to look behind him. Now, Bunyan means us to understand that the ragged, broken man is a picture of every man. And every man and every woman, Bunyan is saying, needs to find the narrow gate and needs to go through that narrow gate because... It leads to eternal life. Now, why does Jesus say these things? He says them because he loves the broken, ragged world and its broken, ragged people. Let's be clear about two things. These words are addressed to the world. They're addressed to everybody. Sometimes a person will say, well, I'm not religious. These things surely can't be for me. But Jesus doesn't recognize categories like religious or non-religious. He's only interested in people. In fact, he once said, I didn't come for the righteous, I came for sinners. Which is a great relief to me because I'm a sinner. It means that he came for me. These words are for everybody. Don't hide from them because they're the best news in the world. But secondly, let's be clear that Jesus came to the world as savior. And that means that he came to rescue those who are under sentence of death, which is all of us by nature. Here's an, uh, a comparison, if you like. If you were traveling by ferry from Stranra to Northern Ireland, and if you were to fall off the ship into the sea, at that moment, you don't need an instruction manual on how to swim the breaststroke. You need to be plucked out of the water immediately. What you need is rescue. Now, Jesus came as the rescuer. He didn't come just to give advice on how to love other people. He didn't come just to model a mature and well-rounded human existence. No, he came to save lost men and women, to save all of us from destruction and to bring us to eternal life. If you're not yet saved by him, there is nothing you need more than to be saved by him. You don't need more money. You don't need better health. You don't need better housing, 
What you need is to be saved for eternal life. And let's never mistake Jesus' motives. He loves us, and he's shown us how much he's, he loves us by dying for us. He died to bear the deserved penalty of our sins. He died in our place. He had to pay the ultimate price so as to secure our salvation. As he said himself, greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. And that's what he has done for you and for me. Now let's look carefully at these words of Jesus. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Let's notice four things here. The two gates, the two roads, the two crowds, and the two destinations. It's quite plain and clear. Two gates. One is narrow and small. The other is wide. Two roads. The first one is narrow. The second one is broad. Two crowds. One a big crowd, the other a small crowd. And two destinations. To use Jesus' words, not mine but his, one is destruction and the other life. First, then, the two gates. Jesus is asking us to think of a large crowd of people. Just imagine being in that large crowd of people. We're all out together. We're walking in the countryside, dozens of us. We're enjoying our walk. We're chatting as we walk along, looking at everything around us. Suddenly, there is a big gate in front of us. It's the obvious way forward. And we're just starting to move through this big gate when somebody speaks up and says, Are you quite sure this is the right way? There's another gate just up the hill there a little way. And people peer to where the man is pointing. And they say, where is it? He says, over there. And they say, what? That little little stile leading up the steep hill, nobody's been over that for ages. There's hardly a sign of human footprints anywhere. This is the gate to go through here, this big one. It's absolutely packed hard by countless human feet. There must have been hundreds passing this way only today. Well, what is the meaning of this narrow, small gate? Let's allow Jesus himself to answer that question. He says in John's Gospel, I am the door, or the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Jesus is saying that eternal life can only be reached via him. And you can begin to see why he calls this gate narrow. A lot of people today would use that word narrow. They'd say, that's a very narrow approach, isn't it? To say that eternal life can only be reached via Jesus. Is God so narrow-minded that he will only accept people who come via Jesus? Surely God is more accommodating. But Jesus says... Enter by the narrow gate. He also says in John's Gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He doesn't deny that there's a broader approach or a wider gate, but he makes it quite clear that the wider gate does not lead to eternal life. Enter by the narrow gate, he says. Let's move now from the two gates to the two roads. One road is broad and wide and easy. It's the obvious way. It's the way that most other people seem to choose. It's comfortable. But the other road is narrow. It looks difficult. It is difficult. It goes uphill where the wind blows sharper and colder. And as you stand there looking at the two gates, trying to make up your mind which one to go through, you know very well which road is going to be harder. You can see that the narrow road will be more tiring. It's going to make demands on you, which the broad and easy road never will. And you shrink from it. Well, of course you do. Who naturally chooses a difficult course when an easier course is available? Let me try and describe some of the features of the narrow road. It's narrow in the sense that you can't think and do exactly as you please. 
Now, there are no boundaries on the broad road. The broad road is so broad that you can believe and behave exactly as you want to, and hardly anybody is going to raise an eyebrow. But God sets some pretty narrow limits, precise limits, to the narrow road. Those limits are summed up in the Ten Commandments. So, for example, God says, If you're going to walk the narrow road with me, you shall have no other gods besides me. I am to be your chief joy and delight. And therefore, if your life is built around some pursuit or activity which dominates your thinking, your plans, and your daydreams, that is your God. That is your idol. There's only room for one God on the narrow road. The narrow road is not wide enough to accommodate other gods. God also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not steal. I'm just picking out one or two examples of them. It's one of the limitations of the narrow road. So it means that if we're to walk the narrow road, we must be scrupulously honest in all our money matters. We're not at liberty to steal from the government by failing to declare some of our earnings to the taxman. We're not at liberty to steal from our employers by working short hours. There's no room on the narrow road for any kind of financial fiddling. It is a hard road. Then God says, you shall not commit adultery. On the broad road, there is room for any and every kind of sexual immorality and marital infidelity. But God says that such behavior is incompatible with being a follower of Jesus, a person destined for eternal life. Now, this road, this narrow road, is a good road. It is a happy road, but it is narrow. Well, think of the Tenth Commandment, which says that covetousness, the greed for possessions, is incompatible with the narrow road. And yet our country, our whole Western civilization, has become intoxicated with possessions. We see somebody else's car or house or kitchen equipment or electronic gadget, and we feel that we simply must have it. Now, there's all the room in the world for covetousness and greed on the broad road, but the narrow road is tough. It's tough in other respects as well. It requires courage and self-discipline. It takes courage to be a Christian in today's world because being a secret or private Christian is simply impossible. In the four Gospels, whenever Jesus called a person to follow him, he called those people publicly. He did so because he wanted them to get used to the idea that their, their role now was to bring a message to the world, to be public. You can't do that if you hide your light under a bushel. It is a public business. In fact, Jesus says, if anyone is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will I be ashamed when I return in glory. To become a Christian, to walk the narrow road, may involve losing certain friends. It may involve straining certain relationships in your family or your place of work. And it requires self-discipline to walk the narrow road. When you become a Christian, you join the church. Now, the Lord's family, the Christian church, is a wonderful family. One of the great joys of being a Christian is the people who become your brothers and sisters, your good friends. But belonging to this family makes certain demands on your time and energy because you become a servant of the family. You need to meet with the family regularly and take on certain responsibilities. You learn to become more of a giver than a receiver. Now, we need to bear all these things in mind as we stand thoughtfully in front of the two gates. The gates are only a beginning We've got to reckon on the kind of road that lies beyond them. Going through the gate is done in just a moment, but the journey along the road lasts a lifetime. So it won't help us if we rush to the narrow gate without carefully considering the narrow road that lies beyond it. There are many folk who once made an ill-considered beginning. People who said, yes, Jesus is for me, but they never stopped first to consider that belonging to Jesus means walking a hard road. One Christian writer once put it like this, anyone with moral anemia should steer clear of the Christian church. We have to ask ourselves whether we want to pay the price of going up the hard road. It can be a steep price. 
to have the Ten Commandments as a serious, lifelong part of your mental furniture is difficult. Jesus himself always faced would-be followers with, a hard, with the hard facts of the narrow road. There was one time when a man ran up to him enthusiastically and said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, what would you have said to that man if you'd been Jesus? I think I would have said to him, my dear fellow, that's absolutely marvelous. You're just the type I'm looking for, adventurous and bold. But Jesus said something quite different to that man. He said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, do you realize what you're saying, man? Have you considered the difficulties? The little foxes, they have a comfortable earth to go back to when they're tired. The birds have their nests, but I have no security, no place to lay my head. So if you follow me, you might have to go anywhere and do anything. If the master has few comforts, his followers can expect no better. The Christian life is a narrow road, and I'm deliberately emphasizing the narrowness of it this morning. There is another side to this, of course. There is a great deal that could be said about the joy of following Christ, about the sheer adventure of it, the delight, the real delight of learning the ways of Jesus and getting to know him, the support of the Lord's family, the pleasures the pleasures of living with the Ten Commandments, which were not given by God to burden us, but to liberate us and to make us fully human and happy. But that's a theme for another day. It's not what these two verses from Matthew's Gospel are emphasizing. So we have a choice of roads. One is easy, it makes few demands upon us, and there are plenty of fellow travelers upon it. The other road is hard. It's just as hard when you've been on it for many years as when you first set out. In fact, in some ways, it gets harder as we grow older. People sometimes say that Christianity is a form of escapism, a way of opting out of life's difficulties and trials. I've heard people say, your Christian faith, it's just a crutch, something to lean on to ease you through the difficulties of life. Karl Marx described it as the opium of the people a drug that deadens the pain of life. But anybody who's been a Christian for any length of time knows how false those accusations are. Jesus says it is a hard road. And let's be under no illusions. It is. Let's look thirdly now at the two destinations. The wide gate issues onto the broad road. It's easy to go through that gate and it costs us little to go along the road. But where does it lead to? Jesus says, and it's not I that say this, it's the Lord Jesus. He says these awesome words. The way is easy that leads to destruction. And this truth, unpalatable as it may be to the, to the modern Western mind, is one of those truths that is repeatedly emphasized, not only in the teaching of Jesus, but in the Old Testament and in the writings of the apostles in the later part of the New Testament. Now let me anticipate a question that some people may be uh, thinking. You may be thinking, but how could God send anybody to destruction or hell if he's a loving God? Well, Jesus does warn us in other parts of the Gospels that God indeed has the power to send people to hell and will use it. But in these verses, Jesus is putting the matter in a different light. He's speaking here not of God sending, but of people going to destruction. The whole point of these two verses is that Jesus is presenting us with a choice that we must make. The responsibility rests fair and square upon our shoulders. He is saying to all of us, enter by the narrow gate. I'm inviting you. I'm commanding you because I love you. There is another gate. But be warned, it leads to destruction. Now, <clears throat> he couldn't possibly speak to us like that unless we had the capacity to make our own choice. It is our responsibility. The two gates lie before us. If we deliberately go through the wide gate and down the broad road, we have only ourselves to blame when we end up in destruction. Does God want any of us to go there, to choose that road. Of course not. Nothing grieves him more than to know that anybody 
should choose that way. It was precisely to save people from that terrible destination that he sent Jesus into the world to be the narrow door that leads to life. Jesus is the way of escape from destruction. I'm sure you know those famous words from John's Gospel that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, he gave him up to sacrifice, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, go to destruction, it's the same thing, but have eternal life. Anyone can be on the road to life in just a moment if he will choose to enter the narrow gate. It's a warning. It's a warning from the God who cares so deeply about us. We warn our children when they're in danger, don't we? And we warn them because we love them. We'd say to a little boy, a little son, don't run into the road, Johnny, it's dangerous. Or we might say to a little girl, don't put your finger in that electric socket, Samantha. It'll be bad for you. It's because we love our children that we warn them of danger. And it's because Jesus loves us that he warns us against choosing the wrong road, against choosing to go to destruction. What then is this destruction? Well, Jesus doesn't go into great detail in his teaching about what it's like. He speaks in other passages of it being a place of torment, a place of outer darkness where men weep and grind their teeth. But if you think about that word destruction, you can see how it's the very opposite of God's characteristic activity because God is the creator. He has made us so that we should live and blossom and rejoice and inherit eternal life. Destruction is the opposite of creation. It's the end of everything good. It's the final snuffing out of all peace and delight and hope. Do you want to choose that? What is the other destination then? The other destination is life. The narrow road leads to life. And by that, Jesus means eternal life. Now, of course, to be a Christian greatly affects our life in this world, greatly. But the goal of the Bible gospel is beyond this world. Jesus came with the promise of eternal life for all who turn to him. He says elsewhere, I came that people should have life and have it in all its fullness. It's eternity he has in mind. He's not just talking about life in Glasgow in 2019. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, will live forever. He said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread will never be hungry again. To come to Jesus is to be put back in touch with the source of our life. A person without Jesus Christ is rather like a plant locked up in a dark cupboard. The plant is cut off from the sun. It's dying fast. It's drooping and pale and sickly. But when you bring it out of the dark into the sunshine, it recovers. It becomes beautiful. It's restored. It bursts into flower. That's what happens when a person goes through the narrow gate. Life begins to return. Now, it may take time before that person grows into strength and maturity, but immediately that person is on the road to eternal life because now that man or woman belongs to Jesus and Jesus is life. Then finally, let's notice the two crowds. There's not much to be said about them except to notice the sad fact that it's a large crowd, many is Jesus' word, that goes through the wide gate and a small number, few, he says, that enters the narrow gate. Why should there be so many for destruction and so few for life? Isn't the answer that people compare the two roads rather than the two destinations? They say, this road looks easy, that one looks tough, so I'll take this one. But is it worth it? Is it really worth choosing a few years of sin and self-centeredness followed by an eternity of destruction, when we can choose a few years of the toughness of the Christian life, followed by eternal life and joy with the Lord. Which is the better choice? Isn't it obvious? But, says Jesus, few people make that better choice. The majority choose the easy road and its destination. 
One of the striking things about these words is that Jesus presents the world with two alternatives. There's no third. There are two gates, two roads, two crowds, two destinations. There's no mention of a third. We deceive ourselves if we think there might be some third category. So let me say this, friends. If you're on the broad road now, it is not too late to change course. Even well on into life, it is not too late to change course. A window of opportunity remains. Turn round, leave the crowd, go to the narrow gate and knock. It will be open to you. You won't be refused entry. Jesus died that your sin should be forgiven. These words come to us because he loves us. Enter by the narrow gate. The gate is narrow, the way is hard, but it leads to life. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Dear God, our Father, we thank you that it was your love for the world that lay behind the sending of Jesus, that he should offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins and pay the penalty for them so that the gate of eternal life should be opened to us. Have mercy upon us, dear Heavenly Father. To those of us who are walking the narrow way, bless us and confirm us in it, we pray, and keep us steady and secure. For any who are not, we pray that you will call to them lovingly and mercifully and give them the courage and the grace to come to you and to find the joy of eternal life in your presence. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, our service comes to an end now by the singing of a, a great and well-known hymn. Let's turn in the hymn books to number 772. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. This hymn is sung all over the world. <clears throat> Everybody knows it. But it speaks to us of the real love of God, the grace of God, which really means his love that has not been deserved by us at all, but which is accessible and available to us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Number 772.
As we stand, let's bow our heads. And we'll finish with some more words of our Lord Jesus. He says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace and kindness to us, and pray that you will help us all to trust you for your name's sake. Amen.